Have your Bibles open at Psalm 104, but it sounds like you don't need it there because you have just expounded in song exactly what Psalm 104 is all about. What, is a, what a blessing to be able to sing those truths and echo the words of Scripture together. But have your Bibles open in Psalm 104. The, in, in 1997, Ed Welch, a well-known Christian counselor, wrote a book entitled, When People Are Big and God is Small. That book has been mentioned many, many times from this pulpit. And it, the, the, the context of that book is it addressing issues of, of peer pressure and codependency and fear of man. And that book also correctly identifies that we all battle with what we think that other people think about us. And we tie ourselves into pretzels and get our knickers in a knot and spend all sorts of emotional and physical energies about living up to this narrative of, of what social media says we must be and the individualism and narcissism of our culture. We all do that. And Psalm 104 that we will consider just very briefly provides us with a glorious alternative and a glorious remedy to that way of thinking. There is already an appropriate title given in many of your Bibles and then in the opening verses. O oh Lord, my God, you are very great. Indeed, the psalm wants to orient our thinking in exactly the opposite way that our culture is trying to turn us. Here we want to see what happens when God is big and people are small. Time does not allow us for a full exposition of this psalm, although you did quite a good job now. But we want to consider the, the big themes and then make some applications to our contemporary lives. Remember in high school, in your English class, in your literature class, when you had to analyze those set poems, and you looked at this poem, and you thought, what is that all about? And then your, your teacher and the textbook seemed to drag out a whole bunch of stuff that you never saw in that poem. I think Psalm 104 would be a real doozy for even the best English teacher. The poem, the Psalm, starts off its intention right away. And it says, it states its, in, its thesis. And it says, bless the Lord, O my soul. O Lord, my God, you are very great. And then the remainder of the psalm gives evidence to support that very thesis. O Lord, my God, you are very great. And even though our modern society has lost some of the significance of, of adjectives like that, where a simple skateboard trick is considered awesome, we can appreciate what the psalmist is getting at here. It's almost as if he doesn't have big enough words to be able to express how good God is. So then he continues throughout the rest of the psalm with the most excellent poetry and a, a mix of glorious descriptions and fine details and wide sweeping statements and definitely some heart-stirring encouragements. And he does that mainly through his description of God's work in creation and then God's ongoing work of sustaining that same creation. So he opens in the opening verses considering God's work in the heavens. And he speaks of the stars, the sky, clouds, the wind, all of them being under God's control. When one wonders what the psalmist's understanding of, of cosmology and the solar system was, I've heard verse 5 being used, misused, by flat earthers and those that believe in a geocentric solar system. But our psalmist knows that it was God who established and secures the earth. Verse 5 to 9, I think if you reread that with the, the mindset of it describing the flood of Noah's day, something that we wish that the paleontologists and evolutionists in our world would not simply dismiss. In verse 6 to 9, he turns his attention from the heavens to the earth and shows how God is solely responsible for the creation of a place for man to dwell on and then also a protection of that place for man to continue dwelling in. 
verse 10 to verse 18, turns from showing what God did in creation to how he sustains the earth and all the creatures that he placed in it. He provides for all his creatures food and water and habitation. The psalmist then takes a stab at the idolaters and the pagan worshippers of that day and our day who venerate the stars and the moon and the sun when he says that it is the great God who made all these celestial bodies and he made them for a purpose in dictating the calendar and day and night and seasons and tides, the, the cyclical natural cycles that we know and enjoy here on earth are regulated by God and it is his intention and purpose. And the pagans worship these as, as deities, but actually they don't realize that they are worshiping the God who made these very things. God sovereignly and powerfully reigns over all these things, from, from the tiniest creepy crawly at the bottom of the ocean to the great big blue whale. He exerts his sovereign control and will over all. And he provides for them, and he provides abundantly for them. But he also determines their boundaries and limits their life according to his good pleasure. The, psalm, the psalmist concludes with a logical progression. And it follows that a true appreciation of all that has been detailed in the psalm must put you in the presence of a great God, a very great God, a God who is worthy of all praise. And if you esteem him worthy of all praise, then you must continually be praising him. And we see in verse 34 that such worship is not only expected, but it is also a, a source of eternal joy and of great blessing to the worshiper and also a very strong warning to the unbeliever. So that's a very, 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 very quick overview and doesn't do the psalm any justice. We'd barely get a pass mark in our literature exam, even if the pass mark is 30%. So I encourage you to spend more time, indeed spend a very great amount of time in the studying the psalm and mulling it over and thinking about the truths and the details of the psalm. And I'm sure that as you do so, you'll make many relevant connections to our modern day lives but we want to draw some principles and applications for our lives today. The, the world today, as we know it, is in a frenzy over a number of things that a proper view and appreciation of this very great God that the psalm describes will immediately dispel and set at ease. The most significant and overarching principle that I think we learn from the psalm is that, and you can, by the end of this, hopefully you're going to say it with me, that our God is very great. Our God is very great, and the rest of the universe is all subject and subservient to him. And yet, joined to that same understanding is that the reality that while God is very great and greater than all that he created, he is still personally and intimately involved with every aspect of all that he created. In his excellent book um, entitled Death by Living, N.D. Wilson explains the sentiment so radically clear when he says, understand this, we are both tiny and massive. We are nothing more than molded clay given breath, but we are nothing less than divine self-portraits, huffing and puffing along mountain ranges of epic narrative arcs prepared for us by the infinite word himself. Throughout scripture, we see this theme repeated. The same very great God who made you fearfully and wonderfully, who made every one of the gazillion stars that fill an infinite universe, that same very great God feeds the sparrows and clothes the lilies and sees to it that the righteous will never need to beg for bread. He is a God to be feared and to be revered. 
But he's also a God who is benevolent and gracious, more than the best father that there ever was. The, the, the creative power that made everything that there is, is still directed at sustaining you and keeping you. And even more astounding is that this very great God is not just the creator and the provider and the, the meter of needs, but he is overwhelmingly generous as he does this. Verse 14, you cause, you cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread to strengthen man's heart. This is, this is not some weak prosperity gospel or some false understanding of, of God's blessing in our lives, as if, as if being a Christian means always living with restraint and with a, with a poverty mindset. The psalmist shows us through these examples in the world around us that our God is very great. And because of that, he doesn't have to conform to our understanding of, of blessing and reward, of withholding pleasure just so you can teach a lesson, of being, of being frugal even though there's overwhelming abundance around us. So, Christian, enjoy that strong, glad heart and that shiny face as the gifts that they are from a very great God. How, how does this um, reality influence the way that you're going to face Monday morning? How does it influence the way that you face the end of the month salty cracks box? How does it, how does it explain the way that you face the unexpected bonus from an appreciative boss? How does it help you to understand the chronic illness that just won't give you any rest? How does it help you to explain and, and determine the gifts that you buy and give to the people in your life? How does it explain the trips and the vacations that you plan and, and enjoy? Let your answers to those questions be guided by the reality that you belong and were created for a very great God. How does this reality then influence some of the other hot button, hot topics in our society? And consider just briefly the issue of the climate debate. No matter where you stand on that issue, you will agree that that debate has taken on issues almost of like a of religious proportions. There's deniers and activists and petrol guzzlers and tree huggers and all stop oilers and protesters completely wrapped up in this debate and, and antagonism. There's so many questions, isn't there? Is climate change real? Is it, is it an existential threat? Is it something we have to be concerned about? Is it from human activity? Is it just a natural cycle? I don't know, but I know one answer. Oh, Lord, my God, you are very great. God knows, and he has it all under control. He's working out all things by his determined counsel and for his good pleasure. Now, of course, that doesn't mean we just sit back and become fatalists and do what we want with the resources and the technologies that God has given to us. The, the psalm and the Bible is chock full of instruction, literally from beginning to end, on how we are to steward what God has entrusted to us. And there's, there's room for engagement. Actually, there's not room. There's an expectation that Christians will be leaders in the matters of environmental stewardship and, and care for this creation. But we don't have to get worked up about it because God's got this. He remains in control. There, there's not a wind or a hailstone or an ozone molecule that isn't there that has managed to escape his sovereign control. So we must openly declare in any situation where we're confronted with these issues that our God is very great. And even when things don't look like we think they should look like or 
things that we want them to look like, we should know that he knows and that he cares for this earth way more than anyone ever could, even Greta. So be a good steward of this amazing planet, but realize that you're not the savior, you're not the solution, though you could be part of God's solution in it. Furthermore, see that Psalm 104 makes no place for anything other than a world and a universe that was specifically planned and created and ordered by a very great God. The world has to balk at this. They have to deny this. Because if this place and all of its if this place and all of its inhabitants just came about by a gazillion random impossible mutations and chance events, then there's no need for accountability or responsibility before somebody. There's no need for fixed principles to live by. There's no absolutes in this world. And therefore, everything is open for interpretation and for change and reinvention. So gender and sexuality can be fluid. And ethics and morals can be tweaked just to accommodate the current understanding. Ethics and morals change, and in so doing, the very great God becomes small, and people become big. But declaring our God to be a very great God orders our thinking in a thoughtless society. And it provides reasons for standing on principle and being steadfast in a world that is all wobbly. We would settle our minds and immediately quell so much controversy and angst just by acknowledges, acknowledging this in some interactions that we have with people. Simply saying to somebody, it is my firm and settled belief that God is very great and that he has ordered this world and he has cre created it with fundamental, unalterable, absolute principles. If you said that in the, some debate, nobody can have an answer against that. It takes that high and mighty person in their self-made throne and disarms him and places them before this God who is very great. Try it sometime. Somebody asks you, why, why do you have that sexual ethic that you do? Why, why do you spend the whole day at church? On Sunday, well, because my God is very great. What about the angst about the, the economy and the political situation and the future of my children? How are we going to survive and provide for our needs and for our futures? Don't you know there's a crisis? Of course, any rational person will recognize and attest to that. Anyone can see that the economy of the world, not just the country, the world is up to maggots. Even the very great God. He is not surprised by any of it. He is not fretting. He knows the concern of the central bank, and he knows the concern and anxiety of your heart as you're thinking about the upcoming payments that you have to make. And you know what? Verse 27. These all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. God not only knows your economic concerns, he's given them to you so that you will look to him as the one who meets these needs. And as you do so, you will indeed turn around and say, my God, you are very great. He's a, gen a generous God, a benevolent God. He's faithful. He is loving. But sometimes he prepares a table for you in the presence of your enemies. He makes your cup overflow. And then you get a bum smack because you messed on the tablecloth. No one has seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. Of course, this doesn't mean that every Christian life just always comes up roses. 
nor does it mean that the Christian life is free from, from suffering and from anguish even. But it does mean that suffering gains a purpose, of, a purpose of, of refining, of, of convicting, of convincing you, of reorienting the objects of your trust and becoming more like the one in whose image we were fashioned. Like any great work of literature, any poem that you studied in high school, there's often a twist and a catch. Consider verse 35. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. How can God be so very great if he is willing to hear such a plea of the psalmist and maybe even us? And then act on and execute that order so that sinners be consumed and the wicked be, re, be done away with. How can that be a description of a very great God? Well, absolutely. Just because you don't think that that's a great act doesn't mean that it isn't. C.S. Lewis understood this when he allegorized it for us all in Narnia. When Lucy, speaking to Mr. Beaver, about that lion that she saw. And she says, is he safe? And what does Mr. Beaver say? Safe? Who said anything about safe? Of course he isn't safe. But he's good. He's the king, I tell you. God is very great. And he's great both in his love and in in his justice, in his kindness and care, and in his sternness and judgment. His love and his justice are both expressions of his perfection. Without his justice, we would have no cross. Without the cross, we would be expected to live absolute perfect lives in purity and in love and comprehension before him for all our days which, by the way, is impossible. So thanks be to God for his justice and that he saw fit to meet that demand for justice through his son. There is no greater display of how very great our God is than in the comprehensive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Do you appreciate that? If you do, then let your life reflect that you worship a very great God. And if not, we beg you, and, and you need to beg Him to grant you that, that faithful repentance to believe in the one who came to be the ultimate provision for all of God's people, lest you go the way of the wicked in verse 35. So in closing, our Lord is very great, and his character and his work displays it to this day. Can you say with the psalmist, bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord, my God, you are very great. Let's pray. Our Father, our eyes have been lifted through your word to the greatness of all that you are. And we openly admit and confess that we fall far, far short in our ability to recognize us and display it in our actions and attitudes. But we pray for your gracious intervention to direct us further and further towards this truth. Even as we do now and come before you in prayer, knitting our hearts together before a God who hears these prayers, because you are very great. Amen.